Hi everybody, welcome back. So if you've been following me at all, you, you probably know a couple of things. One is that I am going through um, my own withdrawal of Xanax. Um, you probably also know that um, I've put out a series of videos where I'm trying to talk about everything from coping mechanisms to my own journey to what I've learned over the last couple of years just doing my own informal research, you know, interviewing you know, people, talking to doctors, uh, looking at what's out there in terms of the anecdotal research and all the different you know, hundreds of thousands of stories of people um, and their experiences both on benzodiazepines and off, coming off. Um, and, and in doing that, what I realized is I've had a lot of conversations with people and something kind of stopped me in my tracks and I realized I might have jumped ahead too fast. And what I mean by that is I've had a couple people say, well, you know, I, I hear you're doing this thing. Um, sounds like those benzos are, can be really tough on some people. You know, I'm on clonopin, um, not a benzo. Uh, or I've had somebody say to me, you know, well, my mom's not on benzo, but she is on Valium. Or I've had some people say, well, you know, um, you know, I would never touch, you know, you know, a benzodiazepine, but I, you know, I, I haven't been able to get off Ambien, which is a, a Z drug, which I don't talk about as much, but really, honestly, I should probably be even, I'm not on it, so I don't, I haven't had the experience of being on the, the Z drugs, the sleep drugs, but they carry some of the same risks. So I realized in doing this that, that people know the name of the drug they're on, the generic or the brand name, but they don't often know the class of the med. And so the class of the med being the benzodiazepine, the name of the drug being Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, Valium, Librium, right? Uh, and it really shouldn't have come as a surprise to me because when this whole thing began for me a couple years ago, the whole reason I'm in this mess is because I had an adverse reaction to an antibiotic called Leviquin. And when I did my research um, after getting sick and being gaslit and being told there's no way this antibiotic caused this, I realized there were four black box warnings uh, on this drug, on this class of medication called fluoroquinolone antibiotics, Leviquin being one of the fluoroquinolones. And I, I kind of went on Facebook and started talking and started telling everybody I knew, like, stay away from these fluoroquinolones or use them as a last resort. There's four black box warnings. They're not to be used for, for minor infections like the way they're being prescribed often. And I would have people say, oh, yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate that. You know, I, I wouldn't take that, but, you know, I have taken Cipro. And I take Cipro a couple times, you know, every couple of years for a UTI. Or, and I would say, but Cipro is a fluoroquinolone. So, again, we tend to know the name, but we don't often know the class. And, again, I don't know why this would come as a shock because in my clinical practice for years, I would have people come in and say, you know, I just got back from seeing my prescriber or my doctor, and they um, added something for insomnia, or they added something to boost my my antidepressant. I would say, well, what is it? Well, they put me on a little bit of Abilify to boost my antidepressant, or they put me on 50 or 100 of Seroquel to help me sleep. And I would say, okay, well, you know, we just need to note, you know, you are on an, that is an antipsychotic. And they'd say, no, 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 it's for insomnia, or it's for this, it's for that. And I would say, well, you know, these meds, there is oftentimes an off-label, lower-dose use, and maybe they use 50, you know, for of Seroquel for, to help with insomnia, and at a much higher dose it's used for schizophrenia, but the reality is the class of the drug is an antipsychotic. Why is that important? It, it's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, again, informed consent. We need to know what we're putting in our bodies, and the class of medications we're putting in our bodies matter. Uh, why does it matter? Well, for a whole host of reasons, one of them being genetics. And I'll just give a perfect example. When I got sick after my antibiotic injury, um, I did some genetic testing. And in my genetic testing, it came back that I was a very slow metabolizer of Valium, um, which is a benzodiazepine. And it showed that the entire class of antipsychotics, all of them, showed that I had a very high potential to be one of those people that would have potentially a very adverse reaction to an antipsychotic. Does that mean that if I had schizophrenia, I wouldn't take this medicine? Not necessarily, because there really wouldn't be another option if I were wanting to go the med route. It means that I would you know, be maybe at a higher risk of developing something like a tardive dyskinesia or a movement disorder um, or extreme weight gain or all the different kind of the, the adverse effects that come with being on an antipsychotic. So for somebody like me, if I didn't know that, right, and I walk into a doctor and they say, well, I'll just give you a little Seroquel for sleep, 
you know, but, but I'm, and I don't know it's an antipsychotic. I'm not told it's an antipsychotic. I'm told it's for insomnia and I don't do my research and I'm not informed that I'm going to go take this drug and potentially have an adverse reaction to it. So again, I'm all about informed consent. And I do realize that I jumped ahead and started talking about benzos when maybe people are out there thinking, I wonder why I feel like crap on my clonopin, or I wonder why I can't get off my Xanax, or I wonder why mom is in the nursing home and they've just ripped her off her Valium and now suddenly she has a dementia diagnosis that she didn't have a week ago. This is the kind of stuff I'm hearing. Um, and so I want to I want to backtrack and, and say the names. And so this video will go out with the name on it, Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, Ativan, Librium. It'll be the same video, but I'm going to say it for each of the particular medications within this class. And I've also had you know some people say, you know, Jennifer, you know, you're making this big deal about this medication, and is it really that big of a deal? Um, you know, doesn't it help more people than it hurts? I, I think that meds in general, you know, uh, many medications help potentially more people than they hurt. Um, again, if you if you listen to my videos, if you hear my agenda, my agenda is informed consent. If you are given clonopin for perimenopause, which it's widely prescribed for, um, then you should also, I want you to get informed and I want you to look at what's out there. But I also think that you deserve to know that you're on a benzodiazepine, that there's a high risk for physical dependence, that a certain portion of the people that take it um, have a very hard time coming off. And for many people, and I'm one of those people, um, you know, a, a med that I took for a couple months is going to take me a couple years to come off safely, and I'm quite sick while I'm doing it, okay? Um, so, you know, again, informed consent. So am I making a bigger deal out of it than it is? I don't think so. In fact, I think benzos, and if you saw my last video on why are we not being listened to, there's various reasons why I go into much greater detail of why I think this is not getting the attention it deserves. But I point to the people that are trying to actually push the agenda, the doctors out there that are working on our behalf to say, hey, these meds come with some pretty high risks. Uh, there are people doing that work for sure. But just to look at some basic stats. So I remember, you know, reading something right, um, right as COVID was hitting. So these were pre-COVID numbers. And it was something like, you know, well over 90 million prescriptions for benzodiazepines were written in the United States in 2018. And then I was looking at something recently that the, um, and I want to get this right, the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics came out recently. I think they were looking at 20, maybe 2020 stats. And it was 66 million doctor's appointments in the U.S. each year result in the prescription of a benzodiazepine. 66 million doctor visits a year in the United States result in the prescription of a benzodiazepine. And when they broke it down kind of further and looked at it, it was basically that for every 100 adults that walk into a doctor's office, 27 were walking out with a script for benzo. For every 100 that walked in, 27 walking out with a benzo script. Now, why is this alarming? Well, we don't know. You know it's hard to break down. You know, Were some of those 27 people just getting a script because they have flight anxiety and three times a year they need a benzo for that? Again, a, a, that's probably an appropriate use of the medication, an acute situation, short term. Maybe somebody has to attend a traumatic funeral and they need something to help with a few days while they navigate that time. These are appropriate uses of these meds, okay? But again, if you go back through my videos, I, I talk about um, the fact that unfortunately, we don't have robust studies looking at the effects the neuroadaptation, the effects on our brains and our nervous systems for being on these medications 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I've met people that have been on this medication for 40 years. In fact, I had somebody reach out to me just the other day about their 9-year-old being placed on a, on a benzo, and I talked to somebody a couple weeks ago where their 82-year-old mom um, was in an assisted living and did not have a dementia diagnosis, had been on Valium since her since she was 40 years old, so she'd been on it for decades. A new doctor came in, didn't like her being on it, ripped her off of it, and now she meets full criteria, and they tell her they're telling the family that she has Alzheimer's. And so, but not recognizing you've just basically cold turkeyed somebody off of a benzodiazepine that they've been on for decades. Now they suddenly meet criteria for dementia because they're psychotic. Um, this is the kind of stuff that's happening. So do I think that I'm being over-the-top, dramatic, hyperbolic? No, I don't. And, you know, 
just to drive home another point, um, you know, in those same statistics, so for every 100 people that walk in, 27 get the benzo, and one-third of those were also being prescribed an opiate. Well, one thing we definitely know, um, and, and certainly I think has gotten the attention of a lot of people, but yet it's still happening, is that a benzo and an, op and an opioid are basically a marriage made in hell in terms of the risk for, um, for overdose. Okay, and so as we're watching the news and we're watching all of these, you know, from Whitney Houston to whoever, and, and you know, we just lost another one a couple days ago, um, and the tox reports come out, and we get hung up on the fact that they're on a pain, or they OD'd on painkillers, or they're on heroin. What we're not also paying attention to in most of these um, uh, suicide, um, overdoses is that there's also a benzodiazepine involved. And there is an FDA warning on benzodiazepines for the high risk um, if, it's, if it's being prescribed in conjunction with an opioid. So again, these are, I don't think we're being dramatic enough. I don't think we're talking about it enough. And people are dying. But even take away the, the, the ODs. I'm, I'm, a lot of my videos are about people like me where we're losing our families and our friends and our, and our jobs um, and our what feels like our minds and certainly our, our, our mental and physical health um, in being on these medications and trying to come off. And we're not the unlucky, you know, 0.5%. No, I actually believe, you know, we don't have exact numbers of how many people have a hard time coming off these meds. We know the FDA has already said they're highly, uh, there's a high, high potential for physical dependence after just short-term use, more than two weeks use. Um, most people will become physically dependent upon these meds. Now, will everyone have the problems I'm having or like I'm seeing in hundreds of thousands of people? Um, no, not necessarily. But again, if you look at my last video, I also talk about how that's, how those numbers are probably being skewed. Because again, as I mentioned in my last video, I meet criteria right now on any given day for five to six psychiatric diagnoses. So instead of being seen as somebody who's in benzo withdrawal, I could be being seen as somebody who has agitated depression or OCD or generalized anxiety disorder, or social phobia, whatever. Um, the other thing I think that's happening is, is I'm watching people going into to, um, going into rehabs to rehab and detox from alcohol, and they're also on a benzo. And in those 28 days, they're taken off their benzodiazepine. Well, we also know when you rapid taper somebody off a of benzo or cold turkey them, um, the risk of, of withdrawal symptoms is, is, is very, very high. And so you're watching people go in to be taken off alcohol safely. Um, they also happen to be on maybe some Xanax or some Clonopin, and they come out and they relapse on alcohol. And we're like, oh, they can't stay sober, they can't stay sober. And we're not paying attention at all to the fact that they've also rapidly withdrawn from a benzodiazepine and what we know about for some people going through withdrawal, it can last months or years in terms of the effects, the protracted withdrawal, and that, or, or just even the withdrawal, you know, forget protracted, which is long-term, long-term sustained problems. But people coming off that, you know, six months, a year later, and they're being told over and over again, no, that has nothing to do with the benzos. They're just alcoholics. They just keep drinking. Well, maybe that's the problem, or maybe there's also... The fact that they were rapidly tapered off their benzo. I bring all this up because, you know, as, as many of you know, I was I was in the mental health field for 25 years. I fully intend to return to it, and I consider myself part of the problem, quite frankly, knowing what I know now. Um, I, I, you know, I, again, I say when we, when we know better, we do better, and that's my goal for myself. Um, I also found myself in this situation, um, ending up on a benzo and ending up not being able to get off one in any kind of healthy way, um, without incredibly, you know, what have turned, has turned out to be really, you know, terrible consequences. I blame myself partly for that, uh, for not knowing better and for not doing my own research. Um, but I, I don't want to be part of the problem moving forward. I want to be part of the solution. But when I say I was part of the problem, what I mean by that is I was working in high-end psychiatric hospitals. I was working in private practice. And when people would come in, with new developing signs of depression or worsening depression or worsening anxiety or suddenly they're agoraphobic, they're afraid to leave their homes and they've never been agoraphobic or they're monophobia, they're suddenly afraid to be alone or suddenly they feel like they're kind of falling apart physically or 
um, you know, all of a sudden they look like they have chronic fatigue syndrome or all kinds of things. I was never slowing down and, and really researching. Were they, maybe, had they started a benzodiazepine recently? Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, Librium. Or were they rapidly tapered off one? Had they recently come off one in the last few months or in the last year? Um, I wasn't asking those questions. And quite frankly, nobody else around me was asking those questions. I don't think they're still being asked, quite honestly. Um, and yet I know for me that, like I said in my last video, um, if I walked into a psych hospital tomorrow, um, I could probably meet criteria for five or six different things that I didn't have until I started taking a benzo and tried to come off of it. So I'm not dispelling that people don't have mental health problems and don't have actual bipolar or borderline personality disorder or anxiety or depression or whatever the host of things, OCD. Um, but what I am saying is that now that I know from myself, having been one of them, and I've now t looked at the hundreds of thousands of stories I've found and talked to literally thousands of people over the last few years, um, now that I know for myself, wow, um, I'm coming off this med and I suddenly, you know, look like I, I have agitated depression or severe depression. I look, you know, I've been asked, do I want to go, you know, to residential treatment to go get psychological help? Um, and I've had to pump the brakes and say, guys, I'm in benzo withdrawal. That's what's wrong with me. Um, I had to tell people, I've had to tell the doctors what's wrong with me. Um, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to be blaming anybody here because again, I don't think our system in this country, I can't speak to other countries, is set up for good informed consent of the patient. And I don't think our doctors, I think our doctors are, are the numbers of patients they are being asked to be seen to meet their numbers in whatever medical group or hospital they're working for, it's insane. Um, they can't slow down to look at the research and half the research I think that's being done, my own personal opinion is just from what I've been able to understand and ascertain is a lot of these studies, first of all, they're not existing long-term. For benzodiazepines, there's not a lot of robust long-term studies. The ones that, there was one that was out there that was cut off at the halfway mark because they didn't like what the study showed at the end. So they're just going to, you know, publish this talk about the first part where they work. Um, so I'm not so sure that, that even if the doctors had time, that they are getting the right information. You know, they're, they're getting their information a lot of times from the people that are coming um, and, uh, you know, that are, that are funded through these pharmaceutical agencies. And so, again, um, that's a whole other video that I've done about, you know, um, that how we get our information, how our doctors get their information. But Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, Valium, Librium, these are the, this is the class of medication I'm referring to. The stats are there. The numbers are there. We know it's a problem. We've known it's been a problem for a long time, unfortunately. Uh, there's been writings about it. People have been trying to talk about it for decades now. It's not getting the attention it deserves. And so um, I will do my best to, 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 to play my hand and to, you know, that starfish metaphor that we talk about. Um, I was just talking about this with a friend the other day. And this is kind of my mentality now, which is, you know, this little boy's walking along the beach with his grandpa, and uh, it, all these starfish have, have washed ashore, and the boy's throwing them back, and the grandpa's like, you're never going to be able to save all these starfish, and tomorrow they're just going to land back up on the shore. You can't, you can't possibly make a difference, and the little boy picks up the starfish and throws it in the ocean, and he says, I made a difference for that one. So if my video reaches one person to pump the brakes and say, well, maybe I... I'm not feeling good because of the benzo I'm on, or I just came off, and who can I talk to to learn more about this? Um, if we can, you know, if we can increase informed consent and increase awareness, you know, and, and again, my friend always mentions to me, you know, just the, the degree, just move it, a, move it a degree, you know, the long-term effect will be great if each of us can do that. So again, um, if you're new to this and you haven't seen my videos, there's a lot of other people doing great advocacy and awareness. I'm not the only one doing this for sure. Um, there's a lot of books out there, but you're welcome to reach out to me uh, via email or Instagram. I have those down below, and I'm happy to point you in the right direction of, of great advocacy efforts that are being made, podcasts that are out there, um, doctors that are, that are speaking up and saying, um, I will work with you on a safe taper. 
uh, the Benzo Information Coalition, those types of things. Um, anyway, wanted to circle back and name the drugs by name rather than focusing on benzos as a class. So thanks for listening, guys. Take care.